Well, today is the first Sunday of May, and May is Mental Health Month. And I feel like at the end of a long, stress-filled pandemic year, it seems appropriate to give this subject our attention, especially in the church. For the traditional view of mental illness in the Christian tradition has sadly ranged from demon possession to punishment for someone's sins to a character flaw or usually a sign of a lack of faith. And none of this is true. No more than cancer or heart disease or diabetes are caused by any of those things. For mental illnesses are brain conditions, brain conditions that can be caused by many things, including our genetics, um, a traumatic experience, a brain injury. It is biological and it has nothing to do with demons or sin or one's faith. And God does not cause mental illnesses or blame anyone for them. And the truth is, if we think about it, mental illness does not discriminate. We are all vulnerable. No one is protected by their wealth, their race, their gender, their education, their ability, or their faith. And whether or not we personally are dealing with a mental illness, all of our basic human needs are the same. We all need to have a feeling of acceptance in our community, to have some responsibility, some opportunity to contribute, and an experience of God's love and presence in our lives. So although our scriptures have been used to blame people for their mental illnesses or their emotional struggles, our scriptures actually call us to care, to care for those with physical, emotional, mental needs. In the Gospel of John, Jesus' words remind us that we need to abide in Christ. He says, abide in me and I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. For I am the vine and you are the branches, so abide in my love. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in God's love. And I have said these things to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my one commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. I love these words because they remind us that we all need to be connected in order to be happy and fulfilled. Although sometimes it seems almost impossible to be honest and aware of what's going on in the world and be happy, But what we really long for is joy. And all that we see happening around us and to us makes these words of joy sometimes feel like they're not in touch with our reality. But that might be the point. Because joy is different from the circumstantial happiness that we try to create for ourselves. And so Jesus reminds us, The first thing you have to do is to abide in my love, to stay close. It means to to hang in there in the midst of whatever is happening and stay centered. The kind of abiding that Jesus is speaking of here is similar to the psalm that says, Be still and know that I am God. First, we abide in the love that we have received. And then the joy that Jesus offers comes about when we share what we have and who we are in a wider community beyond just ourselves. So abiding in the love of Christ serves this greater purpose. It's not an escape from the difficulties of the world, but a path to God's fulfillment in the world. And as we heard this morning and throughout all of the stories that we read in the gospel of Jesus' healings, we see that Jesus finds his way to those that are broken 
and he helps them find their way back to wholeness, and then he brings them back into community. And if we are indeed the body of Christ now, we are called to do that very same thing. Mystic Meister Eckhart wrote that a plum brings forth plums not by an act of will, but because it is its nature to do so. And so the worshiping community gathered around Christ, allowing the being of Christ to flow unimpeded into all of the branches, produces what it is by its nature, the fruit of compassion, of loving kindness, of mercy and patience and wisdom and love. Now the early church knew by experience, I think, what science has begun to verify in our contemporary research. That altruism is actually good for us, that giving is good for you, some particular studies from the Center of Medical Humanities at Stony Brook University discovered that actually your, your good chemicals, your dopamine and your serotonin are evoked in self-giving love. And they define self-giving love as compassionate care for others that is unconditional, that it is not dependent on reciprocation, it's not expecting something in return. Spiritually and biologically, we find our joy in caring for one another. And that's the kind of joy that becomes contagious. Even when it feels like the despair of the world is contagious as the daily news wears on our hearts. But we can face those struggles with honesty, openly, abiding in the love of God. We discover our own joy in loving others as Christ has loved us. And we will make that joy contagious too. Abiding in Christ is living connected to this relational God that we have come to know in Jesus. Living connected in community to people who love and support each other unconditionally. Now, when it comes to caring for people, specifically with mental illnesses, there's, there's one example in the early church getting it right very early on, this creating this kind of accepting and supportive community. And it's found in the town of Giel in Belgium. It started with a medieval church with stone arches and spires and a bell tower. For over 700 years, residents of the town of Giel have accepted people with mental disorders, often severe. They've accepted them into their homes, taking care of them. It all began in the 1400s and it continues today. For according to a legend, Dimfna was a 7th century Irish princess she fled to the town of Giel to escape her father, who had lost his mind in grief and had threatened to kill her. She devoted her life to serving the mentally disabled in that town. She was revered by the people there. But she did become a martyr as her father discovered her location and had her beheaded. So the town of Giel built St. Diphna's church in the 14th century where she was buried to honor her memory and it became a popular pilgrimage site. People came from across Europe. They would bring their loved ones with a hope of finding some relief for their mental distress. By 1480 the town had built a small hospice on the side of the church to accommodate more of these pilgrims. And sometimes families would just leave their mentally ill loved ones there. So the local people began taking them in as guests and boarders, as they called them. The practice would benefit both the host and the boarders in those early centuries as they were farmers and the boarders could come and work on the farm with them. Now in our time, families still receive a stipend from the Belgian government to take care of boarders. And now they receive training and support from psychiatric professionals and they have hospitalization 
available as needed. But as they describe it, it isn't meant to be treatment or therapy. People are not called patients, but they are guests and they are boarders. And they go to Giel and they join households and they share life with people who just watch over them. There have been different numbers, hundreds and thousands at a time. In our time, there's usually about 250 boarders living there. And the acceptance of mental difference has just become a tradition in Giel. Treating those with a mental illness meant to simply live with them, to share their work, to share their distractions. In a community like in Giel, people have not completely lost their dignity as human beings. And then over the last century in particular, many group homes from around the world have followed this model of caring. People need a community that understands, that accepts and loves in order to begin the process of healing. Another example of the importance of community is seen in people who are recovering from addictions, involved in communities of Alcoholic Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous groups that are often described as being more church-like than most congregations. Even the theologian Frederick Buchner described these groups, I don't believe that these groups are perfect any more than any human effort is perfect, but I believe that the church has an enormous amount to learn from them. I believe that what goes on in these groups is far closer to what Christ means his church to be what it originally was than much of what goes on in many churches that I know. What is it that makes these groups so much more authentic than some of the churches? Well, it may be a lack of pretension, a brutal honesty, a vulnerability, and the understanding, support, and acceptance that is found in a community where everyone recognizes their own brokenness and that need for the higher power that we know in God. As we abide in Christ, when we allow ourselves to receive this unconditional acceptance of God, just the way we are with our strengths and our weaknesses, our our differing abilities, our different brains, our temperaments, and our own histories, when we have found that, then we can find joy in sharing that same openness, that acceptance, that understanding with those who come into our lives, coming with the need of love and purpose and joy. I believe that this is who we are, who we are as individuals and as a congregation. This community, this church is a safe place to bring your whole self, not to be judged or to be fixed, but rather a place to be loved and supported and encouraged to use your unique giftedness, to use your abilities that may look like disabilities to others. Because this world needs you and God needs your giftedness in the world. So together, As we abide in Christ, we do this in one way, by remembering this life that was given for us and given for all of life, as we share together in the Lord's Supper. So let's prepare our hearts to share this holy meal in prayer.